Good morning, Makers. It's so good to be with you. Um, if we've never met, my name's Derek, and I did meet some of you uh, newer folks here, and uh, we're just so glad that you're here. Um, if we haven't met yet, we would love to help you get connected um, here at Makers Church. There's a bunch of stuff going on. You'll hear about it at the end of the gathering. But we'd love to see you this week at one of our 30 by 30s or say hello after the gathering. And uh, we'd just love to help you get connected here. If you're new with us, uh, you're joining us in uh, a thing that we've been doing for the last, uh, th this whole year. We're walking through... Um, the liturgical church calendar and this book, Common Prayer, has been our guide. And we've been using this, um, inviting you all to join us in daily readings of the Psalms, some written prayers, an Old Testament and a New Testament passage, and some reflections in here. And we do have these available in the back if you're interested in jumping in on this. It's not too late. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a way that we are practicing following Jesus together as we aim to be spiritually formed and practice uh, some disciplines in our lives that would help us be more connected to Jesus and then live the way he's inviting us to live. And so um, you're joining us kind of in the middle of that journey that we've been on. And uh, in the last several weeks, we've been kind of camping out or hanging out in this, this Old Testament uh, story of First Samuel. And last week, we talked about the story of Jonathan. And so just kind of a quick recap. In the story of the people of Israel, um, God has uh, chosen a people through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they've become uh, the people of God, uh, the children of God, the, the nation of Israel. And they are finding their way out of uh, captivity through the Exodus story into the wilderness and ultimately into the promised land that God uh, delivered them into. And now they're, they're forming themselves together as a society, as a community, and uh, they're not very good at it. Um, they first had a series of judges and that didn't work. And now they've requested a king. The, the neighboring territories around them have kings and they, they have this physical being that they can look to for guidance and safety and support. And they say, we want a king too. And so the story that we stepped into last week was they get their first king, King Saul, and uh, he's promising at first, but then quickly disappointing. And uh, his son, Jonathan, we talked about last week, uh, the power of influence. And we see Jonathan step into a moment uh, where his father, the king, and all of his soldiers were, uh, they were cowering, hiding under rocks. They were afraid to step into what God had set before them. And so Jonathan leads his armor bearer and they step into this kind of crazy opportunity and they go and they take on the Philistines. And uh, shortly after that, um, is this story where Samuel, he's the prophet, he's a, what was one of the judges, a, a, he's a priestly figure. Um, he's hearing directly from God and helping navigate what's going on in the life of this community. And uh, Samuel, he completely, right after this happened, he rebukes King Saul. He rebukes King Saul and God speaks to Samuel and says, Basically, I'm done with this guy. I'm going to bring you a new king. And this is where the story picks up today in 1 Samuel chapter 16. It says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. So back up. Before all this, uh, he, God tells Samuel, go to Jesse, and I'm going to show you, I'm going to reveal to you one of his sons who will be the next king. Right? So, so he's gone over and done what God told him to do. He's with Jesse. And they're in this moment now where Jesse's going to bring his sons forward. And God will speak and say, this is the next guy. So this is the moment. It says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. And Jesse then had Shema pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. Yeah, you ever been that kid? It's the worst experience. You know, you're lined up against the wall at recess, yeah. waiting to get picked for the dodgeball team, 
And these poor guys, they're experiencing what I experienced. Nope, not you, not you, not you. And Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? And he's like, oh, yeah, I, there's one more. There's one more son, but he's the youngest. And really what he's saying, he's like, he's not even in the running. He's the youngest, and uh, he's tending to the sheep. And Samuel said, send for him, and we will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in, and he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. And this is an amazing story that I want to unpack this morning. And really what I want to focus on, if last week we talked about the power of influence, uh, this week I want to talk about what it means for us to have integrity of heart. If we're going to be influential people, if we're going to be the kind of people to have influence over others, then we must become those who have integrity of heart and are worthy of that kind of influence that God is looking for to give us. So let's break this story down a little bit. It says this again in verse 6. It says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Now I know what Samuel's thinking. He's thinking what you and I would probably be thinking. He's like, that's a strapping young lad. That dude's tall. That dude is handsome. He looks strong. And why wouldn't it be this guy? And it's like at first glance, this is Samuel, the guy who's hearing directly from God. He is a prophet and a priest, and he's hearing from God, and he's like, that's it. Now, I don't know if he's just tired of this, you know, this whole thing that's going on already. He's like, I don't, I don't want to be here. Maybe he had somewhere else had to go. Maybe he had to go to the bathroom. I don't know. But at first glance, he's like, that's him. And I think sometimes what happens in that moment is what happens in our lives is we expect God to move in the ways that he already has. See, because what this first son, Eliab, demonstrated, what he looked like, what he reminded Samuel of, was of Saul. And he's like, I know what a king looks like. I have this example of a king that I'm, I'm basing all my comparison to, and this guy looks like that guy, and so it might as well be him. And I think sometimes we miss the new thing that God is doing because the new thing misses our expectations. Sometimes we miss the new thing that God is doing because the new thing misses our expectations. We've seen God do it. In fact, we're going to close this day with a song saying he could do it again. Right? If he did it once, he could do it again. But he doesn't always do it the same way. And I think sometimes that's where we can get lost in confusion. Because we're like, God, you did it through a guy like this before. Why wouldn't you do it through a guy like this now? And God is saying, I don't make my decisions based on outward appearance. I make my decisions based on the heart. And so if we're not careful, we can quickly disqualify others from being those that God wants to use in a place or in a moment or in a specific time or season because they don't look like the person God used in the past. Or even worse, we can disqualify ourselves. We play that comparison game where we're like, I'm nothing like that guy or that girl. I don't look anything like, I'm nothing like, I'm not wired like that person that God had used. And so surely he couldn't use me. And we jump to those conclusions so quickly. But God is looking to do a new thing in this moment. God is always up to doing something new. But here's what I want us to, to just wrestle with today. God doesn't work through formulas. He works through processes. We want a formula. We want this plus this plus this equals success. Tall, dark, handsome, strong. That would mean the guy God's looking for, right? We, we want this formula. We want a formula all the time, and we're always looking for it. it you, sometimes we're like, we want to get holy quicker. We want to get changed quicker. We want to Figure out how to become more godly or more like Jesus. And we're like, what's the one, two, three step thing that I can do? And God doesn't work in formulas. He works through a process. 
And so it says, and, and not only does he work through process, but, and this is the whole moral of the story today, if you don't hear anything else, God never works from the outside in. He always works from the inside out. He says, I don't work, I don't care about human appearance. I care about the inside of their heart. He says this, but Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height. One plus one doesn't equal two. For I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And this is why the Proverbs are so wise to tell us. In Proverbs 4.23, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. If God cares about the heart, we should spend less time doing our hair and our makeup. I don't wear makeup, but some of you do. Um, making sure we have all the right clothes on or looking the right part. But really, we should be tending to the things of our heart, allowing God to tend to the things of our heart for everything we do flows from it. And we're going to see this play out here in a bit. But the reality is, is that God wants to do amazing things through you and through your life. God has a plan and a purpose for every single one of you. He wants to use you. Mark talked about being the conduits of God. He wants to be at work through your life, but it all begins with what we allow him to do in our hearts first. So God wants to work through us, but it starts and it, and it sustains with how we allow him to work in us. But we're, we're so drawn to the outside appearance, aren't we? Like, we can hear this, and we're like, that's cool, but I still keep doing it. Well, our whole world's ordered around it. Like, I've never used a dating app because I was married before dating apps existed. But, you know, the whole swipe right, swipe left thing happens because this is what we do, right? There's a whole app. There's a whole economy of connecting others to each other through specifically outward appearance. Swipe right. And it doesn't just happen in dating relationships. It happens in all the spaces that we find ourselves in. It happens when you're sizing up a church, right? You're like, meh, blue carpet. Now nah, I'll find somewhere else. Or the chair's kind of old, kind of angled a little forward, not that comfortable. Doesn't look great, right? Or the pastor, it's got a ridiculous mustache. I'm out. Um, and we're just so wired to look at the outward appearance to help us guide our decision making and also our value that we have for ourselves and for each other. And God is cautioning us here against that. In verse 12, he says, so he sent for him. Remember, he says, not you, not you, not you, not you, not you, not you. And he's like, I love how Samuel's like, is there somebody else? And he sends for, he says, verse 12, so he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had fine appearance. And I know what you're thinking. Why does it say that? God's not looking at outward appearance. He only cares about the heart. But yet, David is also glowing with health and has handsome features. Doesn't that piss you off? Wow. Those people, they've got it all. You know? You're like, oh, great. You're like awesome and you're good looking. That's really frustrating and annoying. But I want you, I don't want you to get lost on that. A good exterior doesn't disqualify you from being used by God, right? We're not saying like, just go be ugly and not be worried about that, right? That's not, that's not the goal here. And we, this is what we do. We pendulum swing. We're like, oh, it's not about the outward appearance. So, you know, God, God cares about the heart. That's all he cares about. It, he doesn't say, and if you happen to be good looking, I can't use you. So for all of you good looking people, you're good. You're, you're on the right track. But he says, I care more about the heart. And, and I want you to hear this. That God has a plan. I know this sounds so cliche. But I don't think we can hear it enough. I'm talking to you. I know you're thinking about your neighbor or your, your, your spouse or your friend sitting next to you. But God designs you intimately and intricately. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. He wants to use you, to bring about heaven on earth. His kingdom come, his will be done. He wants you ushered in to that kind of creative work with him. 
It's what he designed us for. God could have designed the world perfectly and fit it all together and said, now go enjoy it, but he didn't. He said, no, I want you to co-labor with me. I want you to come along with me. That's why our church is called Maker's Church, because God is the maker of all things, and we're made in his image and likeness. So therefore, we too are made to make. We are makers. God has something specific for you to do, and he's empowered you. He's designed you. He's equipped you for that. But here's the deal. We don't get to choose how God wants to use us. We only get to choose if we'll let him. That's the power that we have as human beings. We don't get to choose how. And I get it. I understand gift envy. Trust me. Every morning, sitting here in the front row, I've got gift envy over all the musicians and the singers who can sing. I would trade you in a heartbeat. I would rather not preach, and I would rather sing. I'd rather play the drums. I'm really upset with Mark because he could do it all. Right? And I don't get to choose. You don't get to choose how God wants to use you. But you do get to choose if you'll let him. If you'll let him. And here's what I want you to hear. Because I know sometimes in your journey with Jesus, you can be so frustrated. Because there's probably plenty of times in your life where you're like David, out in the field, knowing about your brothers being all lined up against the wall, getting picked for the team, and you're not even in the room. And I know that we can go through times and seasons of our lives where we look, we feel like we're overlooked. Like no one's paying attention. No one is, 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 is seeing what I'm capable of or what I'm good at or what I care about. And I want you to hear this. If God has marked you, he will find you. Even if you're not in the room when it's your moment, he will pluck you out of the field and he will bring you in. It's not up to us to help God Follow through on what he said he wants to do, right? It says, it's, it's, when you're marked by God, you don't have to market yourself. When you're marked by God, which you all are, you don't have to claw your way to the top. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. But it's not a formula. It's a process. It says this about David in Psalms chapter 78. It says, he chose David, his servant, and he took him from the sheep pens. I love it. He chose him, and he plucked him out of the sheep pens, and he brought him into the moment. It says, from tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. And this is what this morning's emphasis is all about. How do we become people with integrity of heart? Because our if, our if we allow God to work through us all depends on whether or not we allow him to shape us from the inside out. How, he doesn't look at outward appearance. He doesn't look at skills. Skills don't qualify you, but they are certainly helpful. And God can shape us from the inside out and put us in positions and situations to gain skills. It says that David led them with skillful hands. He gifted him with ability and skill. But more importantly, he had integrity of heart. And I, I think sometimes we, we, this gets a little bit muddy, right? Because we're saying it, it's not about from the outside in, it's from the inside out. But we think that in order to be right with God, we've got to get all things in order. The good news about salvation, about our acceptance, about God loving us and coming for us is not rooted in anything we can do or don't do. It's all rooted in his grace and his love. Right? That's good, the good news about the salvation of Jesus. You can't earn it. Right? That's good news. But our destiny, how we see God work things out through our lives, is determined by our obedience in allowing God to transform us from the inside out. Yeah. We can get in the way of God using us in the way that he wants to. We can get in the way of that. And so it says David was chosen because he was a man after God's own heart. He had integrity of heart. And I, I just, I, I want us to, to, to sit on that because I know if you're like me, you're like, oh no. <laughs> I don't know if you could say that about me. 
I don't know if I have integrity of heart. I don't know that I'm a man after God's own heart. I certainly feel like that. And so it could feel easily like, oh, I'm disqualified. No wonder I got skipped while I was lined up against the wall. Um, and I want you to understand this. Our brokenness doesn't influence how much God loves and accepts us. Regardless of that. But it does influence how he can use us. I want to say that again. Our messiness, our brokenness, our, our dysfunction, God overlooks all of that. And it's in, because of that, it says, that he's come for us to receive us and to love us and give us peace of salvation. But when we talk about living into our callings, living into our purposes, living into the ways that God designed us uniquely and specifically, it is influenced by how much we allow God to, to transform us from the inside out. And it says, David had integrity of heart. Now, integrity, it, it comes from the root word integer. Now, I know integrity is like, it's a buzzword, right? If you've ever been in a, in a job interview, at least I work in the fire department, and the first question on every interview is, uh, tell us three characteristics about yourself and how it's qualified you to be a firefighter or a captain or whatever promotion you're taking. Everyone says integrity first, right? It's, it's a buzzword. It's a good word. It's 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 meaningful, but I want us to understand what it actually means. Integrity comes from the root word integer. Any math people in the room? Yeah, not me. So tell me if I'm wrong. But integer just means a whole number. It's not a decimal or a fraction. It's complete in and of itself. Integer means wholeness, completeness. And that's what it means to be a person of integrity. It means that we are integrated. When you look at the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, what Jesus is painting for us, what the scriptures are pointing to, is an integrated life. A life that is whole and integrated. It means complete in itself. So we, we see the story of David continue to evolve. There's this, this moment where God plucks him out of the field and he anoints him. And I don't want it to be lost in us. We're going to end here. But see, part of us, our frustration with God is that we want the formula, we want the quick fix, and we don't want to wait, right? But there's a, a massive gap between the time that David was anointed and the time that he was appointed. Amen. There was a span, scholars think of about 15 to 20 years. We're going to drive towards that here at the end. But there was a 15 to 20 years feels like a lifetime if you're young. If you're old, it feels like yesterday. But he was young when he was anointed. And it took 15 to 20 years before he stepped fully into his calling and was appointed as the king because there was a process that God needed to bring David through. It says that after he was anointed, that he, Saul had no idea about this. Saul is still the king. He's reigning as the king. And God strips away his power. And he's being tormented by God. And in order to get his mind off of that, he needs someone to play some music. And so they send David. He's not only a shepherd, he's also a musician, and he's good looking. It's not fair. But he, he starts serenading the king. And shortly right after this kind of the story happens in the scriptures, we get to the story that even if you didn't grow up in church, you know about David and Goliath. And we love the David and Goliath story because we love a good underdog story. Yeah. Pastor Mark and I, we, we went to South Bend, Indiana, I think last year, two years ago, uh, for an event with some friends, and we walked the grounds of Notre Dame. And I'm telling you, knowing what it, I felt like I was Rudy myself yeah. walking those grounds. Like, we love the underdog story, right? Unless, of course, unless, of course, you're the bully, right? If you're the bully, you hate the underdog story. Don't be a bully. But David and Goliath, such a great story. We love it. But I think so many times we, we miss how the story came about. We miss the lead up to the story. We know that if you read the story, David killed the Goliath, you know, this young shepherd boy, no skill, had a rock, you know, killed him with a slingshot, blah, blah, blah. But I want you to see the lead up to this. Because... Just like he shouldn't have been in the room when they were looking to anoint a new king. He never should have been in the battlefield. The story says that he was sent 
by his father to bring food to the soldiers on the front lines of this battle. He was just a shepherd boy. He was, he was, he was Uber Eats. He was just Uber Eats. He was just dropping off some food. And it says that he was dropping off some bread, some milk, and some cheese. Now, these guys, they were paralyzed. They could not advance. They were being taunted by this giant Goliath across, the, across this, this battle line. And I know some of you are thinking, I know exactly why they weren't moving. Because they were eating all that gluten and dairy. And, but let me, let me just tell you, this was long before gluten and dairy intolerances were a thing. Right? This was like sustenance, right, back then. I know all you, like, people with special diets, which I know some of you didn't choose. But I, I'm around some people who are very near and dear to me who choose their own diets. Uh, my, my daughter herself, self-proclaimed vegetarian until she doesn't want to be one. Um, but yeah, I, you guys are like, no wonder they're just not making, making you know, progress here. And he says, he, he shows up and he's just Uber Eats, he's just dropping it off. And he sees Goliath just taunting them over and over. And he's like, aren't you going to do something about this? And they're like, no. And he's like, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to just, I'm going to step into this. Right? And this is where the story picks up. First Samuel 17. It says, So David said to Saul, So David, little David, Shepherd David, said to the king, to the king, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. And Saul replied, You're not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his, he gives him his resume. I love it. He's like, let me totally tell you how I'm prepared for this. He says, I've been keeping my father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. And when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair and struck it and killed it. I know the vegetarians in the room are like, oh no. I mean, this dude was savage. And he says, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. And the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, the Lord be with you because I won't be. And neither are any of us. And he's like, pats him on the butt. He's like, good luck, dude. And he sends him out, and we know the way the story goes. He goes, he defeats the, you know, he defeats the giant and all that. But what I don't want you to miss here is David's confidence that he has, that he's now prepared to step into a moment of his calling. And his confidence is, yes, it is rooted in some of his skill, right? He's like, I've, I've defeated the lion and the bear. I've struck it. I killed it. I was victorious and successful. I'm going to do the same thing to that guy. But he says, but it was the Lord who delivered me from the paw. So he has confidence in his skill and ability, but he has even greater faith and hope and certainty that God is the one who skilled him and also delivered him when his skills weren't enough for the battle. He had in this moment. He wasn't hanging all of his own laurels on his own skill. It's easy for us to do that. I'm ready. I've been equipped. I've been, I've been hardened. I've been, you know, prepared for this. And it's like, yeah, don't forget to give credit to the one who prepared you. And also to the one who saw you through it. Because our skills are necessary at times, but are often not enough. And we need God's provision, and we need his faithfulness, and we need his goodness to see us through living out the calling that he's put us up to. But he knew that if he could insert himself into this, that God would be faithful. And what we see here in this story is we get a look behind the curtain of the process that God had David in. He anointed him, sent him right back to the shepherd field. And he spent time just shepherding sheep, defeating lions, protecting his herd. He was being faithful with the small nothing, filthy, dirty, nothing to write home about things that God had put him up to. So that for such a time as this, for a moment like this, he would be prepared and equipped to step into them. God had equipped him to step into this moment. 
But we get to see behind the curtain. He's saying, look, what I did in secret, what no one saw, my faithfulness and my obedience has prepared me to step into this moment where everybody is watching. And David, David let us know that what he did in secret, what he allowed to form and inform his life is what has prepared him for this moment. And we see throughout this whole story that God cares about the heart. And who you are on the inside is much more important than who you project yourself to be on the outside. Now, when it comes to integrity, if you think about everything in God's natural created order, it's, it's made with integrity. And this is what we know. When you go to the store and you buy a banana, you actually aren't buying a banana. You're buying a banana peel. You're just assuming that there will be a banana inside of that peel. And there always is, because everything God has created in his natural order has integrity. If you buy an apple, and yeah, sometimes there's a worm in there, blah, 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 but you're going to get what's on the inside by seeing what it is on the outside. Except for us. Except for us. This can be expected of all created things until it comes to us. I want to end with a metaphor that will make sense to me. You know, the reality is, is that so many of us, through all of the things that we've been through and all the hurts and hang-ups and heartache and confusion and things that have happened to us and things that we've done to others, they've moved us to be these disintegrated people. And we aren't disintegrated. We're not like divided up like a, like a piece of pizza. It's not like there's a slice of us here and a slice of us there. No, no, no. We're disintegrated like, like, a, like concentric circles, like the rings of a tree. There are layers to us. We're like onions. And there are layers to our lives. And on the outside, things can look one way. But if you start peeling back the layers, we start seeing the truth about who each other is. Uh, I work as a firefighter. And in the fire department, one of the most dangerous things that we do is we go to the roof of a building that's on fire and we cut a hole in that roof. And everything we talk about and train on and think about is we're always talking about testing the integrity of the roof before we step out onto it. And one of the biggest indicators of whether or not that roof will be safe enough for us to step on, I don't need to give a whole fire science lesson here, but we cut holes in the roof to create a chimney effect to get smoke and heat out of the room so that survivors can live and firefighters can find the fire. And it's one of the most dangerous things we do. We love doing it. It's fun truck work. We love it. But we go to the roof, and what happens all the time is usually the veneer of a roof looks like a solid roof. There's great sheathing on the outside. It looks like a, a roof worthy of being stepped on. And one of the greatest indicators of whether or not the integrity of that roof will withstand is how it's made and what's underneath it, what kind of fire load is underneath it. And in a fire department, we know that if it's conventional construction, if it's, if it's actual dimensional lumber and it was built hefty, that that could withstand a lot. It could withstand a lot of fire. If this building's on fire, we're good. We're walking on this roof for a while. Right? But in newer construction, lightweight construction, it's all held together with gusset plates. And, and it's, it's not safe. It's barely safe to walk on when there's no fire load. And the only way for us to tell the integrity of that roof before we step out onto it is to sound it. We carry a roof hook with us and we, we pound on that roof right in front of where we're stepping as hard as we possibly can to test the integrity of the roof. And our lives are just like that. Our lives, they're getting sounded all the time through the pressures of life and those things that hit us and that, that, that bump into us and the flames of life the, that impinge upon us, they start peeling back the layers and the real us gets revealed. And when we're disintegrated, there's different layers of who we are. But when the pressures of life come, whether it's stress or lack of sleep or leadership or parenting or being married or going through a divorce or all of the circumstances in life that, that crash into us, they start to peel back our layers and the truth of who we are is revealed. You ever been uh, with someone you really like, whether you're dating or you're just friends, and you're like, I love this person. They're amazing. 
And then you like travel together or something and you see a new layer of someone and you're like, I don't like this person. And the reality is, is you're not saying you don't like this person. You're saying you don't like that layer of them. You like the layer that you got to know, that surface level layer. But man, once you start getting in a little deeper, you're like, I'm not so sure. Or even worse, have you ever had moments where you did something and it surprised you? And you're like, I, I don't know what came out of me. It like, it like maybe something even scared you. You're like, that wasn't me. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I don't, that, that, that came out of me. I, I don't know where that came from. And the reality is, is it's not just what came out of you. It's actually what you let into you a long time ago that began to influence and shape your heart. And the inside core began to make its way outside of you. And it's in these moments, these pressures of life that begin to reveal and strip away. We can see how fractured and disintegrated we actually are. And I think what's important for us to kind of leave with today is to realize that integrity isn't just about who you are at the core. Integrity is also about who you long to become. Because if you have a hope, if you have a picture of who you want to become, then you will take this Proverbs 4.23 to heart above all else. Guard your heart for it affects everything you do. If you know who you want to become, it will change your inputs. It will change what you allow into your life. It will change what's going on. We set our heart and our mind on who we want to become. It changes those things that we allow in. So that downrange, down the road, the core of who we are will be what we hope it is. It says David had integrity of heart. And we can too. We don't have to live disintegrated lives. We don't have to be divided against ourselves and against each other. Because the good news of the gospel is what Jesus came to do is he came to make us whole. He came to integrate us within ourselves, with each other, and with God. He said this, Jesus prayed this, that we might be one, that we might be whole, that we might be integrated as we are one, that they might be one as we are one. He's praying that, that, that we would be integrated, reconnected, intertwined, with the wholeness of who we are as a person, but also with him as the creator and with each other as the created. This is the kind of shalom, the kind of wholeness that God longs to bring us. But we get impatient because it's a process. This is not overnight success. This isn't say a prayer and it's all done. This isn't, uh, you know, we live in this world that's Insta world, that's Instagram, it's Instacart, Insta this and Insta that. And we want an Insta transformation and a transformation happens over time. And there's this gap. Oftentimes you might be frustrated because you're like, I know what God made me for. I know what I've been put on this earth for. And I don't have any opportunities to step into it. There's usually a long gap between your anointing and your appointing. Or maybe you're frustrated and you're like, I have no idea what God put me on this planet for. There's a time and a place where God's going to pluck you out of the field and anoint you and you'll know full well what he put you here for. But there's a process, a transformation that takes place that only God can do from the inside out. God has a plan and a purpose for you, and we don't get to choose how he'll use us, but we do get to choose if we'll let him. And that happens by us allowing God and saying, Lord, would you come and make me whole? So if you just bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to hear me out, even on this whole David story, because some of you are biblical scholars and you know what happens next, and it's not pretty. Because you're like, wait, this guy, he was integrity of heart. He, he was a man after God's heart. He was a mess, too. 
the whole Bathsheba story, and it gets worse. He wasn't perfect. This isn't what God's asking of us. But what he was willing to do was turn, repent, receive forgiveness, ask the creator to bring him wholeness. Time and time again, and we see this, we see this worked out through many of the Psalms that King David wrote. He wasn't perfect, but he was open to God transforming him over and over again. And so if you're here this morning and the universe inside of you is in disarray, you know something's out of alignment. But, but, but somewhere deep down, you know that you were created for more. You know that, that there's got to be more to life, to your life than this. You know in your gut that you're supposed to have more meaning and more purpose. And that you were created with intention, but you just don't quite know how to see it through. I want you to know this morning that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. He created you in an act of love. And his greatest desire is to be reintegrated with you. And it's in your connection with God that you become whole. He wants, you to con he wants to connect yourself to him. And he wants to bring you integration, heart, soul, mind, and strength. He wants to help you know how to love yourself and love your neighbor and love him. And it happens when we allow him in. Not through religious acts, not through the veneer, not through changing our appearance or the things that we do, but by opening our hearts to God and saying, Lord, would you come and transform me from the inside out? And I know that there are many of you in here this morning who have asked God to do that time and time again, and it's never, you're never done. So the invitation for you is say, do it again, Lord. Would you do it again? Would you come into the, the secret places of my innermost being and put me through your process? Transform me from the inside out. But I also believe that there are some of you here this morning, you've never invited Jesus to do that kind of work in your life. You've never invited him in. You've never even had a hint of what wholeness and integration could look like. And this morning, you're left wanting. You're like, I, I want some of that. Even if it takes time, I want some of that. And if that's you, I want to invite you to invite Jesus into your heart. And it's as simple as saying something like this in your own breath. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I need you. I am fractured and broken and disintegrated. And Jesus, I need you to make me whole. So would you come into my heart and begin the work that only you can do? I receive your forgiveness and I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand to your feet with me, we're gonna lean into another worship song. And my, my ask this morning is if you need prayer for anything, we would love to pray with you here at the piano up here on your right. And specifically, if you invited Jesus into your heart for the first time, we would love to know about it. So if you would come forward and let us know, we'd love to celebrate and pray with you and then help integrate you into the life of our community. We're just so grateful that you're here. Let's worship together.